Do you really? Yeah, I do. But here we go. We're going live. All right. Hey, everyone. We're going to let everyone have a minute to hop in the stream here. This is episode one, season one of the IFR Pilot Mastermind podcast. Today's episode will be on approach briefings. I'm Toby Rice, your host, Master CFI, and ATP rated pilot. I'm here with Andrew Barash of True North Aviation. He's a CFII in Montana. Total legend. Got to fly them if you're out there sometime. Uh, thanks for coming along, Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. Toby, thanks for having me. Perfect. All right. So we're going to give a few minutes for everyone to get on the stream here and then we will get this ball rolling. So in the meantime, Andrew, tell us a little bit about your flying. Where, where are you based out of exactly and what are you doing? Yeah, so currently based out of Missoula, uh, Montana, which is uh, up in the western part of the central western part of the uh, state and uh, way up in the mountains. And uh, basically my background is uh, born and raised Montana. I went to school in uh, 2016, started flying. I uh, went through a 141 college program, got all my ratings, CFI, I, MEI. And within that, I, uh, you know, also started instructing for that flight school. I also instructed out in Chicago for a year. Uh, after I got all my hours, I flew Phenom 300s for a year as SIC, flew all around the country, racked up about 500 hours within one year. And um, that life wasn't for me. And so I switched back. I started True North Aviation. And uh, now I'm based in Missoula and, and flight instructing full time in that. Very good, very good. So, um, what specifically about instrument flying just really gets you going? Yeah, so I actually wasn't really a big fan of instrument flying when I was in training and when I was teaching because you know you fly a one seventy two up in the mountains and similar in other parts of the country like Arizona. You know, for example, it's with all the thunderstorms. Well, we have icing a long, long period of the year, and so I didn't actually get jazzed up about IFR flying until I started flying the Phenom, and once I realized the really amazing capabilities of IFR flying in regards to, you know, just ev the everything that you get from it, the services and the clearances and the protection, as well as just airspace clearances. Um, it, it became a really wide eyed or eye opening experience for me. And ever since then, I really fell in love with it once I actually started putting practicality into it. So relating that back to, you know, how do we go back to training in a 172? I like to relate a lot of the rules and regulations and, uh, you know, not only how to pass your check ride, but also you know, take the real life application that I learned from the jet and put that into your daily flying of, you know, you're not necessarily using everything to pass the check ride in your day to day flying and and vice versa. Day to day flying yeah. doesn't use everything in your check ride. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, and I can attest to that as well. You know, in my experience as a corporate pilot, I'm flying the Citation 501 around the country. And, you know, the things that we learn at flight training are often misunderstood for what happens in the real world. You know, we're always trained to do things like, um, well, make sure that you're as slow as you possibly can be, or not slow as you possibly can be, I should say, but make sure that you are slowed down by the initial approach fix. You have time to set up for the approach and things. And that's absolutely good and true. You should be, still be doing that. But sometimes when ATC says, hey, I need to keep your speed up, or hey, you got traffic here, or there, do this, do that, you got to be able to think on your feet. So IFR is really all about. Uh, planning and uh, having a good game plan going into it. But as far as the execution is concerned, I've found in my experience that you really have to be able to think on your feet. Uh, can you tell me about any experiences you've had to have on uh, thinking on your feet um, when it comes to flying the phenom around? Yeah, and absolutely. With that, and once you get done with that, we'll get into the uh, point of today's episode. Yeah, absolutely. Toby, and you, you've said it uh, perfectly before on your Instagram and on Reels before that you basically IFR flying should be boring. Right. You know, if you plan accordingly and, and that's really in general in flying, but especially in IFR, uh, if you plan accordingly and you plan and prepare, IFR flying can actually be, quote unquote, boring. And it's the and, uh, it's the mindset of having no surprises uh, under the belt. Right. So if you can basically plan from point A to point B of everything that can happen, have plan A, B, C and D already laid out, you're already ready to go. So anything that does arise in the airplane. It's a non-event, even though it is a pretty big event in most people's eyes. It's it's a non-event. Um, surprise wise, I, I actually tell my girlfriend this all the time. And I tell my students this when you know people fly uh, that come from the passenger side and they move into the left seat. Uh, one of my students said he didn't realize how much goes into flying and as a pilot. And we 
and my response to that basically is we practice over and over and over again so much that we make flying look easy, right? We look, make, we make it look like it's second nature to us. And that's actually true. And so I've actually put myself in situation, not like dangerous situations, but I've tried to show situations with my girlfriend. I was like, how complicated this is. And again, I've just, I revert back to my training and I make it look so easy that because we just do it over and over again. And, uh, and to answer your question about surprises, uh, my very first week flying the Phenom 300, uh, it was pretty crazy. I had a, a really fast in dock. I got into the right seat. I got an in-house SIC rating. I forget the regulation exactly, but it follows that training protocol. And within my first, I think it was my third day, uh, they booked us on a flight that landed at LAX. I picked up passengers up in Santa Rosa and I flew into LAX, right seat to, you know, just that, just me and him and that's it. And uh, we are doing this approach and we're talking to SoCal. I'm now trying to understand my IFR radio voice because it is slightly different. There is, you know, clear and precise radio communication that you need to have. I'm talking to SoCal. Yeah. Then I talk to SoCal again. Then you talk to SoCal again. Then you talk to SoCal again. There's like six different approaches, it feels like, into uh, LAX. And they put us up on the northern runway. We were we were landing west and we're descending down and it was pretty crazy because my uh my captain was saying he's like man we're gonna be screwed i i still am trying to process just everything that's happening and i asked him i was like well why why what's wrong and he's like we're landing on the north runways and all the fbos are on the very southern side of the airport so we're gonna have to taxi all the way through lax and now i'm blown away because i i'm barely keeping up with socal approach but now i'm gonna have to talk about ground in my first bravo experience and i have five hours under the phenom you know and so uh, we are doing an approach. We were about to hit the initial approach fix, and we switched over to the last approach before tower. And uh, he, like, he jumped on, and uh, our call signs were Yellowstone. And after he jumped on, he basically was like, "Well, why, Jay? Why did they put you on that runway or that approach?" And we were very confused too. We we're like, "Well, that's just what they told us." And so he said, "Okay, hang on. Tell you what, level off seven thousand feet." Well, we were already at sixty nine hundred feet, descending at a thousand feet per minute. You know. And so we had to immediately put the throttles in, take back off. He gave us vectors, vectors us around. And then we ended up going to the southern side of the runway following a triple seven, three miles in trail and or five miles in trail even. And so that was a quite an experience to be able to zigzag around that as my first Bravo experience and really my first week of the Phenom. And so being prepared means being able to catch yourself from when surprises like that happen, you revert back to your training. It you know, just because we're getting knocked off of one approach and being put on another approach doesn't mean that we have to, you know, act surprised or get behind the airplane. It's just a briefing is a briefing, and that's where your training comes in. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. That's actually a great story. So let's take that and segue right into the to, to excuse me, I can't talk today. Let's segue right into today's topic, which is approach briefings. The biggest thing that I've found as an instrument instructor, and I've got, you know, nearly 3,000 hours of dual given, most of that's you know, private instruments, CFIs, whatever, right? And I've seen a lot of interesting things happen in an airplane, I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, a lot of near-death experiences, a lot of awesome times. Um, but I've noticed the best thing about being an instrument instructor is the ability to sit in the right seat and watch someone else mess up on their instrument flying in so many different ways you didn't think were possible. You're thinking, man, I thought I was a bad pilot. And you start seeing other people fly and you're like, oh, well, I feel good about myself now. But and, and all joking aside, I learned so much about instrument flying just by sitting back and watching someone else struggle with their problems. And I was able to identify the fact that, wow, I actually do have the same type of problems as they do, but maybe in a different flavor or a different mm -hmm. version. So I think it's really important for us as instructors to emphasize to students that, hey, we were there once and we understand your pain and us sitting there. You know, we're not just you know sitting there trying to make your life miserable. We're actually trying to help you, give you tools that you can use to succeed. So um, anyway, that being said, I want to talk today about approach briefings and specifically the differences between the briefings that we have on the ground during lessons or during pre-flight planning versus the ones that we have in the air. And the ones in the air can be divided into say when we're really busy, we have to get stuff done really quickly or um, when maybe we have some time, you know, we're on autopilot, we're cruising along, and we haven't even started our descent yet, but we do know that we have an approach coming up, what are we preparing for, what are we doing? So let's just talk about that just a little bit, and uh, I have some thoughts I want to share as well, but I just want to ask you, what are your thoughts? How do you define, possibly, what's important to know between 
uh, the differences in giving approach lessons versus briefings? Like, what is the line do you think between a an instructor teaching a student how to fly this approach versus the instructor helping the student to become familiar with the approach? And, and before you answer, I think the a, a difference, a key different differing point is that an instructor giving a lesson on how to fly an approach is more like how to fly approaches. And then it splits off to, you already know how to fly approaches, but now it's a matter of what about this specific approach do I need to know to be successful? And how do you think instructors, or maybe what is your technique on um, splitting those up? So what does that look like for you? Just I want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, a hundred percent. So um, if you separate the line between you know, ground and in the airplane, right? In the airplane, we obviously need to be acting quickly and swiftly to get the job done to accomplish the mission so we don't fall behind the airplane. In the ground or in the sim, you can just reset, right? And so we can go over and spend a lot more detail. So for me, when I'm in the ground teaching the fundamentals is, is more about teaching the why. So teaching the understanding of where this comes from and why it is. And all of my why in the instrument flying, all of it boils down to uh, two things. Uh, well, three things, I guess you could call it. Um, the on-ramp, the you know interstate structure, and the off-ramp. That's really what IFR flying is. It's, it's your on-ramp to the interstate system, you're cruising via the interstate system, and then your off-ramp. The whole point of the on-ramp and the off-ramp in, in a car you know, analogy is to accelerate to interstate speeds so you don't become a hazard to everybody else and that you become safe, right? And same with the off-ramp in reverse. It's to de-accelerate. And so on the ground in the approach briefing side of learning the why of where everything is. So <clears throat> there's an acronym that I used to use. I don't really use it in training, but the fundamentals is still there of, um, I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's black or it's a B6Ms. Um, which is black boxes, and I, I could go down the whole list, but it's basically misapproach, sure. minimums, you know, that sort of thing. And so following that logic, it's essentially the same left to right, top down, like a book. And the one thing I talk about in the ground is understanding, you know, again, symbols and symb uh, symbology, and then, you know, actually where the text is. Because a lot of people, at least in my experience, they see this approach brief and they zoom right into the pictures because, you know, as pilots, we like pictures, right? And so actually getting them to reset, go up to the top and understanding, you know, where everything is. And the perfect example actually happened to me the other day. Uh, you know, the box, the black box of airport elevation, touchdown zone elevation and runway length. Well, for 172, we don't really care about runway length, but why? Right. I always like to relate why. Well, if you're flying a Phenom 300, you're definitely going to care about runway length more or 737 or even a 747. But the one that we care about the most is obviously touchdown zone elevation because of and the why is because if we see lights, we get to descend to 100 feet above that. And a big misconception that everybody has is you know, because you fly an ILS, it's 200 feet off the ground, then touchdown zone elevation, you see lights, you get to go 100 feet above that. So everybody thinks that it's 100 feet below minimums, which it's not, right? And so uh, understanding that why, and then understanding where the information is on the ground, compared to the airplane, when you learn how to brief the approach, you can do it swiftly and effectively. And the biggest important thing, at least in, you know, we'll, let's call it in the professional world, is are you up to date? Are you legal to fly this approach and are you capable of flying the approach? And so if you can break those three, three things down, you can go through, okay, yes, we have the right approach. We're legal to fly the approach. And based on the criteria at hand, we can fly this approach. Hmm. And so it's a being, very good way of breaking it down. I like that. Yeah. So very, very swift and effective and go back to the LAX scenario. We took off and we had to resequence. I mean, it was all visual conditions, but you know, LAX, you want to be on an approach path anyway. And so when we broke it off, we had to do, so we were on the north side, we broke it off, climbed up to 7,000 feet. He gave us a right turn. So he broke us off further north and then sequenced us back underneath all across all four runways and then the re-intercept. So I had to scramble. He, the pilot was flying and I was not flying, I was monitoring. And so I immediately, you know, they climb back up. I'm setting his heading bugs. I'm immediately turning back to the right. You know, I'm immediately, the first thing I do, I was like, I'm not even going to worry about it. Delete flight plan. Just clear it out of there because I don't want anything messing me up. Delete flight plan, LAX, direct LAX, um, and then uh, load up the approach I want. And then immediately look at the top saying, Captain, do you confirm this is the approach we have? Right. And he said, confirm. 
boom. And then, yes, we're current. Let's go talk about what are our minimums and our altitudes. Set, set, set. Boom. We're, now we're going to be legal and now we're setting ourselves up for success. I like that. And that's very important because the difference, and I think we did, we have this disconnect in flight training where students and instructors, they, they, they don't know where the line is between are we a professional flight crew that already knows what we're doing or are we having a learning moment that takes more time and energy to, to, get, to dig into. Uh, so something I've noticed in a lot of flight training scenarios is the instructor will uh, you know, overbrief the student on the approach while they're in the airplane, which is necessary sometimes. But then uh, in some cases, the instructor might not say anything to the student. He might just presume the student understands what's going on already. I think that's because we don't know how to define the difference between instruction and briefing, lessons and briefing, right? And I think that's a really, really important uh, distinction to make. Um, so. I think probably the most important thing to know when it comes to briefing approaches is how to ask the right questions, right? You said this a second ago, and I'm pulling this up in my notes that I have here. Um, my notes here says, okay, it's, it's what, why, where, how, and when. What, why, where, how, and when. What am I looking for, right? It's about getting the right information to our eyeballs, right? We want to see the right information. What am I looking for? Why am I looking for it? Right? Why does this information matter to me? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, there are times when I really don't care that much about touchdowns and elevation. If right. it's a day when the ceiling is really high, I just don't need that. Now, yeah. I do need the touchdowns and elevation. You know, I've got low ceilings, low visibility, and the chances of me needing to add 100 feet to that for regulations to be able to descend below my minimums to 100 above the uh, touchdowns and elevation if I see, you know, the approach lights and whatnot, you know, I might need that. I don't need it all the time. So why am I looking for it? Next is where can I find it? Where can I find this information? Um, where is it on the plate? That comes down to you learning how to actually brief an approach plate, how to look at it and know where the information is. Then next is how will I use it? You know, we just use that, that correlative learning. Like we know in, in flight instructor school, we learn about the, the levels of learning. You know, you have rope memorization, understanding, application, correlation, and synthesis. Uh, we're correlating the, the knowledge that we've learned previously to a real life scenario. So how will I use this information? And then uh, lastly is when do I need it? Mm -hmm. I don't need to know everything about that approach plate from the exact second I pull that piece of paper out right. or I you know, pull up for flight. I don't need yeah. it immediately. Um, yeah, I mean, the perfect example of that is, uh, I mean, how often do we look at the alternate, you know, minimums triangle, right? We don't need that all the time. And so we don't really need to be briefing that in the airplane all the time or the temperature, you know, uh, notums that, or the uh, that note section there. We don't necessarily need to be going into detail because some of them have one line and it's no big deal. It's like, okay, nothing happens. And the other, other times where it's like in that LAX scenario, if I like sat there and read all the notes that were on there saying, okay, well, alternate minimums are this. And that, it's like, we don't care about that. Fly the plane, yeah. right? Exactly. We care about what's practical. So practical approach briefings is the goal. So a uh, quick spot here. Uh, everybody who just joined the podcast, welcome aboard. This is the IFR Pilot Mastermind Podcast, season one, episode one. Topic today is approach briefings. Uh, I'm here with uh, Andrew Borash, who's a CFIII and MEI, also a corporate jet pilot out of Montana. He's the owner of True North Aviation. If you're in Montana in the Missoula, Bozeman area, be sure to check him out. Um, True North Aviation on Instagram. And uh, I'm your host, Toby Rice, master flight instructor and ATP rated pilot, corporate pilot out of Nashville area, as well as flight instructor. And uh, I fly out of Dixon Airport, M02 in Tennessee. So if you guys are just now joining the podcast, just now joining the live stream on YouTube, welcome aboard. Uh, glad to have you. We're going to keep going on approach briefings. So pulling up my notes here. Let's see what we got. Okay, so we talked about the questions that you need to ask. So people don't seem to understand that talking through an approach plate is not the same necessarily as a briefing an approach plate or teaching an approach plate. There's, there's differences we need to know. So I think it really just boils down to asking the right questions, knowing what do I need now? What do I need later? Mm -hmm. So 
like getting that information that you want. So let's kind of look at that and, and try to figure out what is practical in this scenario and what's practical on the ground versus in the air. So uh, Andrew, what do you think about this? Uh, how would you brief an approach in the air versus on the ground? Maybe your pre-flight planning versus say, you know, you're in the air, it's busy, you just got a, ch a change for the approach from the controller, or maybe uh, the difference is you already knew what approach you were getting and you have a little time to prepare for it. What does that look like for you yeah, when you're briefing sure. approaches on the ground, on the air, or in the air versus on the ground? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So if, you know, if we just take it down into the simplest form, uh, you know, very top level of what do we need in the airplane? Uh, you know, if we, what we could do is pull, pull up an approach or, you know, uh just talk sorry just talk down your same flow left to right top down and so i kind of follow that same mindset like i said earlier of that uh the b and six m's acronym uh what i find the most important is uh let's say for an example you're flying the ils ils frequency is absolutely critical that's the very first thing that's the top left corner that's why they put it up there so briefing the ils frequency and double checking immediately that it's in your box now, because uh, there's been so many crashes and so many accidents or instances where uh, that wasn't briefed or that number was just off by a little bit and they flew the wrong approach and they landed on the wrong runway. You guys can look that up on your own time uh, countless times. And these are all professional pilots like airline guys that happen. So from there, you move over to the actual approach itself and making sure that you have the right approach. Right. So you're briefing airport name and approach category, you know, and everything in between there. Uh, from there, you look down the side, and so you're outside of the main box of the approach plate. Looking down the side, making sure that's current, right? Now, uh, in the IFR world, obviously, if it's not current, it's not legal. You can't legally fly that approach. And so, uh, but back in training, you're always right. You know, eyes are just from uh, top left, right, straight down. You can. It's just a really easy drop. From there, you go straight back to the top, and you're briefing across. Now, based on the scenario, Toby, like you said. If the weather is, you know, 10,000 foot overcast or even clear, you're not necessarily caring about touchdown zone elevation. And if you're in a 172 and uh, flying, like we have 9,000 foot long runways scattered all throughout Montana. I don't really care about runway length for the most part. Right. But those are still good to talk about saying, okay, at the very least we have touchdown zone. We've briefed where it is and we know what it is. And then at least we say, okay, we have 9,000 feet of runway. We have plenty of runway. After that, I immediately go to the mist. And I want that to be kind of the first ingrained into their brain of saying, okay, let's read the mist and talk about that. From there, glance over at the notes, any notes that affect you, just a quick glance saying, okay, are we, is this a alternate? Is you know, is there, is it cold out? You know, anything that might apply to you in the notes, like look for it briefly, but just, if it's just a normal approach, then throw that out. We'll not throw it out, but skip it. Right. Move on. Then I go into the I plan. Have a question. View. Yeah. I have, a, I have a question real quick. Are we talking about in the plane or on the ground? Like where, where are we? This is what, plane. We, what, this is in the plane. Okay. So yep. in the plane. Now, are you, are you busy or do you have time to kill right now? Because I think our viewers really want to understand what do I need in certain situations? Because they, sure. they already know. They already know how to read through in a whole approach procedure. And hopefully by this point, if they don't, they can learn that. Right. Right. But right. I think what do they need right now? In a certain scenario so where are you when this approach is being briefed and what are you looking for and how quickly is this happening yeah okay absolutely so i always say in the perfect world but there's only one thing that's perfect so and that's not us and so uh we can't you know we can shoot for perfection but we can't expect it and so in a perfect world you're briefing this approach 30 40 50 miles away from the first to set point you're in a cool calm scenario but that's never never or almost always not the case right it's usually something that's happening and so briefing the important topics of you know frequencies uh you know currencies and making sure that you have the right approach and then i go you know after the miss i go plan view making sure that i am aware of which direction i'm coming from and what i say with that is if i'm going to make a right turn or a left turn or straight direct to the initial approach fix or vectors right what am i going to be expecting am i expecting direct to the initial approach fix or am I expecting vectors? And that gets me into the mindset of knowing like, okay, when it comes time, let's say I'm gonna make a right turn to intercept the localizer, for example, for an ILS. That comes time where if I load up the autopilot or if I have autopilot and I'm going to make that turn and all of a sudden the plane starts doing something opposite to what I'm expecting, instantly I that 
rings in my brain of like, okay, something's wrong. I can fix it. So I'm briefing where I'm going and how am I turning or which way am I going to be directed. From there, I go straight down to the altitudes and I'm making sure my altitudes match my flight plan. Or if you don't have a flight plan GPS, you're making sure that you know your altitudes and what those minimums are. And then the last thing I say outside of that is how low, how long, and which way. That's one thing I, I say for every approach, regardless of how busy I am. How low am I going? So if you're doing like a descent to DA, it's how low is minimums, which is your ILS minimums or your LPV minimums. How long is the misapproach point? Where is the misapproach point? For a, a precision approach, it's at minimums, where on a non-precision approach, it's either the end of the runway or a certain mile criteria away from a certain point, right? So how low, how long? And which way? So the which way is the first turn. Am I going a straight out climb? If I'm making a right turn to 9,000 feet, that sort of thing. So those three sections of title legality and making sure everything is programmed correctly, which way am I turning? And then how low and uh, how long am I going for? How low, how long, which way? I like that. It's pretty good. Angela, let's do this. Let's pull up an instrument approach plate and just kind of talk through it and see what's going on. Yep. Um, for those of you listening to the podcast, you may not be able to see our screen, um, but uh, you can go back and look these approach procedures up on your own time. I think first we're going to look at the uh, VOR runway 18 approach at the Shelbyville Airport, Shelbyville, Tennessee. It's Sierra Yankee, India. That's the airport code, Shelbyville VOR runway 18 approach. Let's just look at this procedure right now and kind of see what's going on. So, Andrew, how would you uh, break this down? in the airplane let's let's say you're on a training flight right and yeah. you know you just you just did a missed approach at another airport you had to divert and for some reason you're, you're not going to your plane to alternate and you, you were just handed this procedure in the airplane yeah how absolutely. are you going to make this happen how are you going to get to the ground and not hit anything yeah absolutely so very first thing is uh you know this is assuming you're going to Im immediately plug in your approach into your gps right you're going to want to make sure that either a your gps or what or your vor whatever you're doing on your panel that needs to be programmed from there immediately i the first thing i look at is the frequency 113.55 if that doesn't match i need to figure out what's wrong and or you know if i programmed it wrong or if i just need to dial it in that's the very first thing because that's the most important at the very end of the day that's what's going to keep you lined up with this approach, right? Mm -hmm. From there, approach course inbound, right? Setting up your CDI, however you need to do, setting up your headings, whatever advancements of a panel you have, whether basic or advanced, that's the next thing, right? And then, of course, touchdown zone elevation, like we've talked about here, depending on the weather. And then the very, you know, as you sweep across the top, VR runway 18, you know, Shelbyville Airport, I have, I'm, that's, mindset where i'm going that's what i want to do and yes i'm reading it so it's visual confirmation that i i brought the right plate drop your eyes down 21st of march 2024 perfect from there immediately go back up to the missed approach especially if this is an alternate we're kind of in the mindset of you're always planning for that next step even if it's a clear in a million to be honest you're always planning for that next step now at 172, of course, you know, if you you know have to go missed or go around, you can just go around into the pattern. But if you're flying a jet or a big airline, their standard procedure is to go and fly the missed approach. Even if they, you know, let's say it's a high windy day and they go around, not because of weather. So briefing the approach or the mist right there is climbing right turn to 3000, you know, the VOR and hold. Okay, great. I move to the left into the notes, like I talked about earlier. Make sure that you any notes that might apply to you. You know, and you're kind of just quickly skimming through this in the plane, and 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 it obviously depends on your mission if it's alternate or not, right? From there, uh, you're usually talking to IFR, so your frequencies are usually going to be told from um, ATC, and that you know it's not always the case, but that's always a good thing to have to make sure you're talking to the right person, whether it's going to be Unicom next or you know you're basically setting that next step up. From there, plan view. It depends on where you're coming from. Again, you know, the plan view, I brief from which way am I going to turn? How am I going to enter this approach, right? It, are you going to enter the initial approach fix and make a straight in? Are you going to do the procedure turn like most VORs are, right? How are you going to get vectored? If you have the advanced autopilot and advanced avionics, you could probably get vectors, right? It, it all just depends on what you're flying and how you're, you know, where you are. If you're coming from the south, most likely you're probably just going to go direct to the initial and do the procedure turn, right? So after you determine your location, it's a situational awareness thing. You drop down to the altitude, 
and you're talking about your altitudes on which way you're going to be descending, where can you descend, right? And that's the big thing I talk about um, with my students based on, you know, after you get cleared for the approach, I talk about how uh, when you're clear for the approach, you're cleared to turn, you're cleared to descend, right? And so where am I cleared to descend? Because these are altitudes that are set to protect you. So as long as you're within the protected side, you can descend, right? And then after that, obviously, you're talking about minimums, how low, and in this regard, it's 1500 in a mile, right? With uh, how low, how long, and if you look here, the how long the misapproach arrow starts over the VOR, which is over the off of the middle of the airport. So obviously, if you see the runway at your misapproach point, there's probably a good chance you're not going to land unless, you know, pull something up. And then which way, right? You can see the box to the uh, right side of the uh, profile view is the right turn, climbing right turn 3,000 feet. So the breakdown, the, the data, the plan view, and the profile view gives you a good mental picture of making sure you're at the right space, you're situationally laterally aware, and then you're vertically aware of where, aware of where you need to be. Okay, that sounds good. Now that took you know five minutes to talk through, right? Now, that of being course. said, that We're being explaining said, too. This is this this is an explanation. So now we just we just reverted back to the explanations as opposed to briefing. So we got to figure out how do we boil this down to where you can just simply move your eyes across the page, know what you get, and get everything that what you need in you know fifteen to thirty seconds. Um, so let's look at another uh, procedure. Well, actually, I'll tell you what, look at this one first. I just want to give you some thoughts on this one. So yeah, this is really important in instrument flying. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remove the uh, this, this full screen layout here and go back to this. So I think it's really important. People need to understand this. There's basically three phases in the instrument flight. You've got departure, you've got on route, and you've got arrival. It's from the ground to the sky from the sky to like we know where you're going, right? And then from the top of descent to the runway. That's what you're working with. Now, sure, there's phases in between, I understand. But let's just boil it down to that for now. A pilot basically has two jobs. Number one is navigate. The second thing is don't hit stuff. If you can navigate and not hit stuff, you're doing all right. So. There are things that we can do to navigate and not hit stuff. We can have certain courses, certain altitudes, what have you, that will allow us to, you know, do those things. Um, you can navigate visually, right? You can navigate um, using published procedures. Right? There's a million of things that you can do, but your goal is to navigate and not hit stuff. So let's, let's look at this procedure and quickly figure out what do I need yesterday to make, to make this happen. So this is the VOR and my 1-8 approach into Shelbyville. So I'm going to pull that up right here. Okay, so my first class, when I see this approach, I see it's a VOR approach, so I got to have that. I look at it immediately, I see that it starts at the VOR, ends at the VOR. That's the first thing I see, right? I'm not looking at frequencies, I'm not looking at chart, currency, dates, revisions, none of that stuff. I'm looking for what do I need to know right now to see, is this going to get me down? All the semantics can be looked at. I know where to put my eyes to get the information that I want. If I want to verify this chart is current, which is important, I will look to the right or left margin and get that information. If I want to see the chart revision, I will look up and see that. I do want that information. I don't want it right now. I want it later. Or maybe I've briefed it already. So for me, I see this in the VOR and we want it at Shelbyville. Uh, it's an initial approach because Shelbyville. I'm going to go outbound from Shelbyville, 332, stay at or above 3,000, do a procedure turn, and come back in down to minimums, 152 inbound, straight in men's or 1,500. It gets me down to 700 feet. Cool. Off the top of my head, I know what this approach is promising me. It's promising sure. me traffic. It's promising me terrain and navigation on those parameters. Yeah, absolutely. So I look back up. I see, okay, 1355, plug that in. Approach course 152, plug it in. But the thing is, where am I? So let's just say that I am uh, 20 miles east of Shelbyville. 20 miles east of Shelbyville, I can see I've got to be at least 3,400 without... Um, uh, for my MSA, right? My minimum, my minimum safe altitude is 2,500 within 25 miles of Shelbyville. That's only required for me if I don't have ATC comms. And let's just say that. Let's right. say I lost comms. I'm in an emergency. I got to get down. What am I going to do? I'm going to go direct to Shelbyville at least 3,400 within 25 miles. I'm at 20, so I'm good. So what I'm doing, I'm going from here to Shelbyville, outbound 332 down to 3,000, inbound 152 down to 1,500. 1355 is the frequency, 152 is the inbound, plenty long runway, 
do it with the notes, do it with the missed approach procedure, which is a simply a right turn in the hole to 3000, super easy. Trigger tubes are there if I need them. And I've got uh, runway lights and I've got pappies. That's all I need to know. Yeah. Like I have briefed this approach. I know I'm going to hit the show me Vovia or I'm going to go out and come back in. Super simple, right? Yep. But Absolutely. how did I know where to look? That's the biggest thing. It comes down to asking those right questions. And that's the thing that people seem to misunderstand about instrument training is it's about asking the right questions. What do I want to know? Why do I want to know it? How is it going to affect me? Like, what? Are, how am I going to use this information? And when am I going to use it? That's really what you want to know to make this stuff happen. So let's look down at a different approach procedure, maybe something a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, easier even. Let's say this one, looking at the RNAV, runway 17 in the Dixon Airport, it's an RNAV approach. I see I've got three initial approach fixes. I'm going to go to ECJA. That's what I want to do. Hit ECJA, 3000 to COSMU, 2500 to ERFE, then my MENS, 1300. It's an RNAV approach, LNAV MENS. Um, so no loss. I got an MDA to level off it. Runway is good. Can't do it at night. Uh, let's see what else. Well, I can. I can't do. Um, I can't circle at night. I should say. So runway three five miles rise at night. I'm good with the frequencies. I've got. You can see on the screen. I've got uh, TAA sectors for Quizmu, XJUP, and UNSES. So I can just look at that. I don't need that information right now, but it's there if I need it. I can simply adjust my eyes to, to that information. Uh, this approach is very simple to fly. There's no terrain, nothing to worry about. It's 3,000 feet down here in the flatlands. I know you're not familiar with that, right? You, it's like, <laughs> see, you have a problem. See, we can't count that high when we think right. about the altitude you have to deal with. You can't count this low. Yeah, like, exactly. You, you have to, like, like when Andrew was in was in high school, he had to start counting at like five. Like it wasn't like zero, one. It's like okay, five, six, seven, eight. That's like how you started counting in school, right? Exactly. So, yeah. So down here, it, it doesn't matter counting. below the ground. It's below us, right? We don't care. Exactly. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so I started counting at five. So, but anyway, it's super simple. I just looked at it. And I got an idea of what am I what am I doing? You know, if I look at a different approach here, let's say the RNAV Delta and the Mazuba. You're familiar with this one. Oh yeah, this is so, actually a pretty tricky one too. Yeah, so let's break this one down. So you tell me, uh, once I get done looking through this, what additional information you might consider on this approach, right? So of course, yeah. this is me. If I'm flying the citation on this approach, and I am at, you know, let's say I'm at 11,000 feet, just circling around somewhere, and I got to get down and land, right? Mm -hmm. And let, just to make this really easy, I'm south of the of all the fixes. So I don't have to worry about any kind of course reversals or anything. I can just go straight in. Okay. RNAV Delta in the Missoula, it's an RNAV approach. I've got a couple feeder routes. I've got a uh, an IAF at uh, Bop T, looks like. Is that how you pronounce that? Bop T? Yeah, Bop, Bop B. Bop, Bop, Bop B. Okay, I had to zoom in a little bit. Bop B. Okay, so I'm going from Bop B to uh, Visvi, Wojo, and uh, Al Hub. Missed approach fix, looks good. Uh, it is circling only. I'm flying in category B in the citation. So I got 4,700 feet uh, minimums, which is puts me at about 1,500 feet above the ground, uh, 1,494. So I got to have good weather. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate to uh, Bot B. I'm going to go from Bot B down to 8,100 and 6,800, then down to uh, 4,700. And uh, the temperature is okay. I don't have to worry about the snowflake because the snowflake, uh, you know, is only applicable to me if the temperature is at or below 12 C, which I'm good. It's daytime. Don't have to worry about that. Um, Airport elevation is pretty high. As far as the missed approach, uh, right turn or left turn to 9,600 to uh, follow the GPS. I mean, I can sit here and look at those fixes all day long, but at the end of the day, I'm on an RNAV approach. I right. don't need to memorize these fixed names. That's the thing is if I can plug in the proper initial approach fix and then simply know the altitudes, the GPS will do everything else for me. Now, that being said, I'm not saying you shouldn't brief these. You should brief every um, fix on the GPS and on the chart to make sure that it's there. But I don't need to tell that to my co-pilot. Right. I don't. As long as my co-pilot, right, if I'm flying the jet, has the same procedure and it's current. So this is revision 21-336, vowed to the 21st of March of this year. If we yeah. both have the same piece of paper, all I got to do is tell them, hey, this is the RNAV Delta. We're starting from Bot P. We're going to be circling to uh, runway uh, 30. And we're going down to the of 4,700. So it'll be... Uh, 8,100 down to uh, 6,800 and 4,700 and just go from there. That's it. Right. And what I would probably do if I'm coming into Botby and I'm at 11,000 at Botby, I would drop down pretty quick 
to that um, 8100 as fast as I could because I'm yeah. going to slow down and get down. So it's a steeper approach angle, but yeah. that's what I need to know right now. So what would you say in addition to that? Because I, I feel like that's a pretty basic, hey, I got to get down. Yeah. You know? Well, and especially in this approach and, you know, there's other approaches around the country, you know, Aspen is one of the re a really famous one that is in the same category of I need to get down. And so one thing that a lot of people miss with these type of approaches is, uh, especially in mountainous terrain, and, and this is very specific to mountainous terrain, is they are very, very steep and they may not feel that steep, but they're pretty steep. And so for an example, like in a jet, you know, all the airliners, they fly this. Uh, actually, we got a lot of RMP approaches like from Horizon and stuff. So th they'll probably fly those here. But, you know, for example, let's say, you know, you're flying the RNAV Delta. A lot of people don't talk about where this is a very um, steep approach. You need to be configured. You know, normally you won't configure until final approach fix or, you know, depending on your, you know, off specs and everything. But this is one that I would actually recommend even being configured at FOPB. One thing that this plate doesn't tell you is ATC around here, they have, you know, they have minimum vectoring altitudes. It's one thing that I talk to my students about that us as pilots really don't know until you really get into the real, real world IFR environment. Uh, they have uh, MVAs, minimum vectoring altitudes, and we have OROCAs. Um, I'm not going to say that, that all ATC uh, controllers don't care about OROCAs, but they care more about the MVAs. That's true. And what this what this plate doesn't show you is BOP, they always, always, I don't know why, but they always are putting you at BOP at 10,300 or above. So you're at BOP at 10,300, uh, you know, even call it 10,100 for easy math. You're at BOP to VISV and you have, uh, what is that, five miles to descend 2,000 feet. You know, I mean, that's a, that's a big steep, especially in the jet. And so going back to what you were talking about, you know, talking to your co-pilot, you know, you're flying that jet, uh, single pilot, uh, you know, kind of often uh, in a crude environment, the pilot flying, pilot not flying, one person's briefing, the other person's uh, monitoring, or sorry, briefing, and the other person is looking at the avionics, so making sure that it's set up correctly. So, you know, yes, you don't, I don't really care about the names of Bapi, Viz V, Wojo. I don't really care about that after I've briefed it. But what I do care about is making sure, so even in a non-crew environment, you're briefing it against the panel, right? You're making sure that Bapi is going to be whatever they're going to give you at Bapi, but then Viz V is going to be 8,100, and you're making sure that that matches. In a crewed environment, you're talking to your co-pilot about that in a single pilot I would say that you're you're making sure that those fixes are the same. After once you've done that and put the fixes in, it doesn't really matter at that point. You're flying the GPS, like you said. You're flying Wojo or uh, Alob, and then going to Wenki. You know, you're just going to fly the flight director at that point because you've programmed it properly, right? It's going back to our beginning conversation of um, you know the more you brief, the more boring it should be, right? Um, and so yeah, so other than that, I mean, talking about what you said, just first glance of this approach that you know that's obviously you got all the big big fixes the other thing that i would say for this approach is you know you're 1500 feet past wojo well if you look wojo is only 6.7 miles from the end of the runway and you have a 30 what is that a, almost a 40 degree intercept angle on that circling approach that's why it's a circling minimum and so the moment i always tell my students and of course this comes from experience but the moment that you pop out of the clouds, you get eyes on runway, you are drop, drop the throttle, break it off, set up for a base, give yourself time, right? Because it, it's even in the Cirrus when I was flying with this, it, it's been hard to, it's hard to come down off of this approach from minimums. Yeah, I can believe it. I mean, just think about this. If I was doing this on the jet, if I had good visibility and uh, good ceilings, I'd probably just to cross over the field and join the uh, upwind for 30 yeah. and just make a yeah. nice left pattern. Um, of course, I don't, I'm not sure if it's left and right traffic here, but I would have had that figured out beforehand, but I would just join the pattern probably. And that's yeah. my ground for 30. So this is a good example, I think, and we'll talk about this for a few more minutes. This is a great example, I think, of the differences between when do I need to spend more time briefing this thing on the ground than I do in the air. This is an approach you think about before you ever take off. This is part of your pre-flight planning. You shouldn't be going out and flying on an instrument flight without having thoroughly briefed uh, the approach that you're going to be flying uh, before you go. Now, especially, especially if those approaches are mountainous terrain and they have weird things going on. That's just not good yeah. planning to not do that. Uh, let's look at the Aspen uh, uh, approach here. because I flew that the other day on the simulator in the citation and it was quite excessive. So uh, this is the localizer DME echo into Aspen, Pitkin County, uh, Sardi Field. So 
this approach is a perfect example of an instrument approach procedure that you do not just brief in the air and go fly. You need to have this thing figured out. You gotta, you need to have a sticky note with your vertical speeds that you're gonna be flying or, or whatever. Now, I'll say this. If you're flying this approach and you have an FMC or a GPS with the VNAV capability, it's super easy to set up. It really is, as far as as far as in the computer. See, that's another thing that flight instructors do a little weird is they try to overcomplicate saying, well, we gotta be this DME from that and this radio to that. I'm like, yeah, that's great. We have a GPS, who cares? All right. However, so actually to that, uh, it's kind of funny. It, part 91, what's your um, no, single pilot operations line, the citation, do you guys have standardized uh, or do you have criteria that you have to meet for stabilized approach? We just do the standard stuff uh, from yeah. the pipe rating school. It's whatever the airplane uh, handbook yeah. is. There's nothing, it's all part 91, there's nothing special. Um, right. It, we, we, we standardize things like this. And I'll say this is we fly the GPS, so use it. But right. if we don't fly with the GPS and we have to fly with something else, we use it. Localizer approaches, for example, require that the whole time you are navigating using a localizer, you must be in green needles. You must be in V-line. Right. Um, so when I'm flying from a red table down to um, a Jargu, I can be in GPS, no problem. But as soon as I hit Jargu and turn inbound, I get to switch it over to VLOG and make sure I'm right. tracking that localizer inbound. Right. Uh, it's more accurate, more precise. And that includes the missed approach course because the missed approach is a localizer that you join. And it's a localizer yep. back course, which is conveniently set to normal sensing, which is really not nifty. Um, but you have to fly that local localizer back course outbound, and that requires green needles. And when I say green needles, for those of you who aren't familiar, green needles is a term we use when we're flying with Garmin avionics, where it's magenta needles on your HSI and CDI yep. um, when you're in GPS mode, and then it is green needles when you're in VLOC mode on your CDI. So it's just a VOR versus GPS of your source. So this is a procedure that I'm not flying unless I briefed it beforehand, and I briefed it for probably 15 minutes before I went and flew this on the simulator in the jet. And then in the jet, I briefed it again to just to make sure I really knew what was going on. But even looking at this approach, let's just break it down super simple. This is a localizer approach, starts at red table, goes to Jargu, and hits the localizer, bunch of step downs. And then the nest is well before the airport. In fact, it's uh, two and a half miles before the airport because there's so much terrain. You've you got to get out early. You just you know, do a right turn, join a climb, join a localizer, hit a couple radials, hit your missed approach, hold and hold. So... It's actually well, very it's, simple. It, it definitely is simple until you start thinking about uh, other criteria. Now, of course, 135 one, uh, or like a 121, but obviously it's not 121 is not landing here. But 135 criteria, you know, stable stabilized approach criteria is you can't exceed a thousand feet per minute. Uh, if you actually do the math based on normal profiles of op specs from other companies, and this comes from my 135 experience, but I believe net jets sure. and flex jets, they all have the same criteria or very similar. Um, you if you're flying your standardized profile for this approach especially in the jet you cannot maintain the you cannot do this approach and maintain stabilized approach criteria um Correct. if you if you actually do the math and so this is one of those scenarios like i i mentioned in um you know you have to have really good weather and in fact actually my uh my do direct ops he uh he told me when i was i i had a chance when i was flying the jet i was going to potentially go to um, Aspen, but then uh, they got diverted and we went somewhere else. But uh, when we were briefing, we were on the phone with him and the chief pilot, and they were like, just fully configure, fully configure, right at the get go, get as slow as you can, because maintaining that slow speed will help you uh, maintain that stabilized descent rate. And he was telling me that anytime that they, like personal minimums, this was their personal minimums over time of flying it in the jet, um, anytime that they would go into Aspen, they would just put it as a personal minimum criteria of if they don't see the runway or if they don't have visual by the initial prospects, they're not landing at Aspen because it just becomes so daunting to try to get down in the IFR environment. And then you add icing and other criteria on top of that, and it becomes very chaotic, very fast. And so briefing these mountain approaches, right? You want to make sure that you're looking at descent rates because that they're not just all standard, right? And so your standard profile isn't going to fit, but it doesn't mean that you can't just manipulate it a little bit and just simply slowing your ground speed down just by a little bit will help you exponentially down the road. Yeah, exactly. Completely true. And uh, I will say one thing is that it does say uh, as far as uh, stability for approaches that a thousand feet per minute is the standard. However, mm -hmm. it says that's, that's what the standard is unless previously needed for 
their specific right. type of approach. Right. And that's just brief. It's what you do. Yeah. I mean, yeah. In the 135, I believe it's in your op spec, which is, you know, your approved FAA. So it is like almost as hard as a regulation for uh, 135 carriers. Exactly. Unfortunately, okay. which kind of, you know, kind of sucks, but. Exactly. All right, let's look at one more thing real quick. I want to make a quick note of today's sponsor for this episode of the uh, IFR Mastermind podcast, and it is the IFR Mastermind itself. We have a community of flight instructors and pilots, professionals, and amateurs that all get together and post all of our best resources and training content for instrument flying and instructing. We've got the podcast here, which you are observing. We've got live Q&A. Uh, we've got uh, courses, we've got training content. People post their questions, and those questions get turned into videos. Those videos get posted to the internet. So you have an opportunity to be able to ask your most burning questions and get them answered by professional pilots. And it's not like Reddit, it's not like another forum where it's all just stuff going everywhere. It's organized, it's moderated, and you've got some top-notch professionals. You've got live air traffic controllers in there. We've got people who are actually controlling airplanes uh, for the FAA. And for private companies, you've got uh, airline transport pilots, uh, CFIs, master instructors, even some pilot examiners coming in. So it's a very, very high value instrument community. It's currently $19 per month subscription to be a part of this mastermind community. On March 7th, 2024, the price is increasing to $29 per month. So get in and lock in your $19 per month rate so that you can have that for the lifetime of your membership. But if you wait until after March 7th, then it will be $29. So that's the IFR Mastermind community. Link in the description below. You can also check it out on my Instagram at Toby Rice CFI, and you'll be able to access the IFR Mastermind community. Um, and one thing interesting about the community as well is that if you are a member of that community, you are automatically and cordially invited to be on this podcast as a special guest asking questions and giving your feedback on certain things. So if you want to have an opportunity to be on this podcast and ask real questions, get recorded and use this as part of your training or just sharing information, then you can go to the IFR mastermind community and put in a request and we will be more than happy to get you on this podcast. So moving forward from that, one thing we're going to mention before we go is the whole point of this episode, which we may have to make this episode, Andrew. I think we may have to take this and put it in as a uh, second episode, maybe version two or something to kind of go into some more things because we talked about a lot of things in this episode. But I really want to hit one more approach just to show you guys how easy it really is to look at a plate you've never seen before, pick up the information that's important right now and just make it happen. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna pull up the ILS runway 2-0 approach into John Toon Airport, Nashville, Tennessee. I have this approach all the time and pistons twins jets everything so looking at this procedure i see i have an ils it's an ils approach i gotta have dme i've got to have a, a, a nav one receiver or a navigation receiver for localizer and dme i've got to have all that stuff cool i also have a gps since you have a gps this makes life significantly easier so this is how i look at this approach procedure and brief it in just a couple seconds this is the ILS 20 at tune, charts, current, revisions, good. Frequency is tuned, approach is course is tuned. I've got DME, good with the notes, good with the frequencies. I'm starting from by call. I'll get vectors to final most likely, which would be to Twitty. By call to Twitty to Jogus to the DA of 701. Uh, missed approach, I'll brief last because I want to have it sharp in my head as soon as I finish the briefing. That's why you always brief the missed approach procedure last if you can. I'm going to buy call at least 2,700. Uh, you could brief the 49, but I can tell you just from experience, you're not going to have to worry about that. But hey, put it in there if you want to. So buy call between 2749 and 20 at 25 or above. Uh, pro tip before I continue briefing this approach is that when you are getting veterans to find all the most important numbers that you can know are the numbers and information that gets you to your final approach fix, which is 20, and the intercept for that. So all I really care about on Pinterest to final is where is Twitty and how high do I need to be? So my main briefing is that at least 2,500 by Twitty. Join the glide slope and go down. I don't have any approach lights. I've got pappies. The runway is long enough. And it's uh, missed approach straight out 2,200. 
right turn 3000, join the radio for Nashville and hold a BB. The GPS will do all of that for me. Once I hit Twitty or once I join the localizer, make sure I'm in VLOG. So that's just how I brief this approach. It's super simple. And I can look at some more approaches as well. Um, I don't have any more pulled up. Actually, I do have one pulled up right here. Pull this one last one. Give me just two seconds to make sure I have this pulled up. The guys who are listening to the podcast aren't going to be able to see this. I'm pulling up the VOR runway 15 into the Martin State Airport. It is a very interesting approach that Andrew and I were talking about the other day. So here it is, the VOR runway 15 approach to the Martin State. If you look at this one, you might brief it and say, okay, this is, looks pretty easy. It's just a, a line. But then you realize the line is curved and you realize, oh my goodness, this is actually not a straight line at all. There are no straight lines on this approach except during the uh, inbound portion of the uh, hold and part of the missed approach for just a couple seconds. This is a DME arc approach. So I look at this and I say, how do I brief this approach? Well, easy. This is the VR15 into Martin State. It's an arc. Look at the course. The course says that instead of it being like a zero five zero course or something, it says Baltimore 14.7 arc. So I must maintain a 14.7 DME arc off the Baltimore VOR. So now I have my whole context built. I now understand how this approach works. I got to get to the arc. Now, I'll be on the Victor Airway between Baltimore and Sloth, the initial approach fix. So I'm going from Baltimore to Sloth, Sloth along the arc using crossing radials to identify each point. I don't necessarily need to brief which radials those are because I'll have them on my plate. I just know I need to use them. That's the biggest thing. I know that they are there. Cool. Um, Sloth be 2600 after the next fix, 1800, then 1260, then minimums of 920. The missed approach is going to be a right turn climbing 2500 to join a radial, then fly that radial inbound till I get another arc at 11 miles, and then fly that to Bose and hold. I brief the approach. Cool. Any questions, right? So you just kind of go from there. Especially, an uh, interesting point on this approach is that I can actually use a GPS for this approach all the way until Goves. Um, once I'm at Goves, I have to have a DME readout, a live DME readout, in order to fly this procedure. Um, but uh, I, I believe that's correct. I have to double check myself. You can fact check me uh, with the FAA's uh, re reference on that. But uh, uh, yeah, I believe it. I mean, I believe it is within. I mean, within final approach, of course. You're right. You have to. You have to make the switch over the green needles, quote unquote. Or you know. Exactly, but there's no needles to fly, so it's kind of weird. Right, but right. anyway, that being said, this is an approach kind of weird looking, and you can spend a lot of time discussing how we do this. But it's really you fly from the initial approach fix to the intermediate fix, to the final approach fix, to the missed approach point, then to the missed yep. approach holding point. You fly each segment. So break it down that way. I, I will it's a lot say, easier. Yeah, I, I will say that uh, you know obviously the more automation you have, the easier it becomes because you can program and brief, but uh, the more automation I, I, I'm trying to teach this into my Cirrus students and my and you know anytime I was flying the jet, just because you have higher levels of automation doesn't mean it will do it for you, right? Staying on top of it, but it, it definitely takes that pilot workload out of it. Um, you know, and, and if you break it down that way, it's exactly how you broke it down. It's you know if you break it down into a simple format into bite-sized pieces, it becomes a very safe and, and practical you know scenario. Hand flying this, no, you know, I would say steam gauges hand flying this approach in the soup. I've done it a couple of times in a sim, and that's pretty difficult when you, you know, I could probably do it now. I haven't done it in years, but uh, I used to have my students do it in the sim, and I only had one student. Of course, they're in training. They have no, you know, this is just a fun, you know, thing to do in the in a training lesson at the end of it, I should say. And uh, I've had one student do this first try, and I was pretty impressed with him. It was pretty insane, but because. Uh, uh, anytime I was in the sim, I always ended up in the water <laughs> when I was in training with this. But I have a funny story That's with funny. this. I I was gonna. I actually landed here uh, at Martin State in the jet, and um, and I got really excited because when I got this briefing and you know the you know dispatch called us and they said we're going to Martin State, I was so excited. I uh, we were in the airplane and I was talking to my uh, captain. I was like, hey, uh, can we do the uh, the VOR <laughs> into the into the, and he was like yeah i guess if you really want to why i'm like look and i showed him and he looks at it and uh i'll save the language but he goes heck no <laughs> so we're doing that in the jet and uh oh, and so funny. yeah i had a different approach but yeah it was a pretty fun pretty fun day going to that one that's pretty funny all right well hey it's been one hour and uh that's enough for discussions for the day 
um, anybody that's watched the podcast or listened to it uh, either on YouTube or on your favorite streaming service, uh, be sure to check out the link in the description for the IFR Pilot Mastermind. You'll have access to this episode as well as all the other recordings and uh, an opportunity for you to be on the live stream and ask your questions, get them answered. So this will be a once per week podcast if we can get this rolling the way we want it to. This is season one, episode one. So uh, definitely thank you for joining us and uh, be sure to leave a good comment with any questions that you have, as well as any episode requests, content you want us to talk about, different topics, and we will certainly consider that and get it done. So Andrew, thank you for coming along and uh, spending some time with us on the podcast or spending some time with me. It's really just you and me. I'm not sure why I said us, but hey, what the heck, right? So uh, thanks for spending some time with me this morning. And yeah, um, absolutely. we will definitely have you back on and uh, we'll go from there. So in the meantime, yeah, anybody, in the meantime, anybody that is interested in participating in this podcast, please leave me a message on my Instagram or send me an email at uh, toby.rice at wingmanflightacademy.com. You can check all that stuff out on my Instagram as well as in the link that's in the description below. Until next time, we will see you all 